but I do want to start by introducing our two distinguished participants for the lunch conversation. Uh, at the end here is Dr. Michael Crow, who I'm sure most of you know is the president of Arizona State University, um, which is the third leg in the triad that supports the Future Tense Partnership, along with the New America Foundation and Slate. Uh, Dr. Crow has been president of ASU since 2002. Before that, he was the vice provost at Columbia and the chief strategist of Columbia's extensive research enterprise. He also helped to found the Center for Science po Policy and Outcomes in Washington, which is a think tank devoted to uh, link, the link between science and technology and positive economic and environmental outcomes. Directly to my left is, is the writer Neil Stevenson. As I'm sure most of you know, he's the author of a number of best-selling books, uh, including the Baroque Cycle novels, Cryptonomicon, The Diamond Age, and Snow Crash, and also uh, Zodiac is another title of his. He was an advisor in the creation of, of Blue Origin, uh, a company that is pursuing private space launch. And he was also involved in the creation of something called the Intellectual Ventures Lab, which is dedicated to uh, supporting new inventions of all kinds. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll hear a little, little bit more about that in a moment. Um, since this is a lunch conversation and we're going to range pretty widely, I, I thought maybe we'd just start before we get into the explicit topic of uh, government policy in relation to technology and just talk a, bit, a little bit about the role of the imagination in thinking about these futures. Um, since we have Neil Stevenson here, you know, one of my favorite uh, literary stories is about the writing of the first, first science fiction novel, Frankenstein, which in fact the anniversary, I believe the 200th anniversary of Frankenstein is coming up. So it's, uh, it's, especially, it's especially relevant here. And uh, the way Frankenstein happened is as a, it was a dinner party game. Uh, Shelley and Mary Shelley and an Italian friend of theirs uh, who was also a writer had rented a villa in Italy and they were all sitting around after dinner. And as a kind of parlor game, one of them pr proposed that they all come up with a ghost story. And uh, Shelley wrote a story which I think has been more or less forgotten. Their Italian friend, whose name I've forgotten, wrote something that was even more forgettable. And Mary Shelley went away and came back a couple of years later having written Frankenstein. Um, the first science fiction novel was written by a woman, of course. Um, it is also, if you haven't read it recently, a fascinating, terrifying book which embodies this sort of fear of scientific discovery, which was a major theme in the Romantic movement. Um, the, rom the Romantics were, were afraid that science was going to destroy all of the poetry and beauty in the world. Um, but uh, Frankenstein is so terrifying. I've, of all the books I've read to my children, they, they claim not to be scared by anything, any movie or anything. But about halfway through, through they asked me to stop reading Frankenstein to them at night because they found it so terrifying. Um, but with that as a just, you know, kind of uh, interlude, I wanted to ask you, Neil, and, and, and then you, Michael, to, as well, to sort of talk about the role of literature and the imagination in understanding the kinds of things we're talking about. Because, you know, at the level of science, these are often hard to grasp, but it's writers like yourself who make them understandable to us. Well, the feedback that I get from um, people in the tech business who read my stuff is that it, it's useful as a kind of, um, of a shared understanding of what a possible future might look like. And so, uh, it, a lot of our technological systems are so complicated now that it's very difficult for somebody working on some small part of it to get a kind of synoptic understanding of what the end product might eventually look like. Um, and um, the, uh, the story that I kept hearing, and I, I assume it's apocryphal, but it may be true, was that there was a certain era in Silicon Valley when people were going into meetings with venture capitalists and throwing snow crash onto the table and saying, this is our business plan. Um, <laughs> and I mean, obviously, it's not a business plan per se, but what it is is uh, a kind of unified, coherent vision, I guess, that brings together a number of different 
technological possibilities. And uh, once you've read it, you understand what that vision looks like. And so if you're sitting around with some other techies or with some venture capitalists or whatever, uh, you can use that as a shorthand. You can say, we're just trying to implement you know, page 37 of Snow Crash or, <laughs> or, or what have you. And that, that seems to be of great value to, um, to, to people who, who, are freak, who would otherwise be stuck in a somewhat narrow and specialized uh, kind of cubicle. Yeah. Uh, Michael, you know, we have the, we're pretty familiar with what, what might be called the, uh, the anti sims bio reading list of, you know, Frankenstein, Brave New World. Do you have a, uh, a kind of pro synth bio reading list? I know you're a reader of, of science fiction, you know, books that help people grasp these things and that don't have a purely negative outlook on where it might be going. Yeah, uh, let, me, let me give a couple comments on that. I remember, uh, and I'll use myself as an example, when I was in the science and technology policy program at the Maxwell School at Syracuse, on uh, Tuesdays we used to sit around and watch the, what was then, this is 82, 83, uh, the technology run amuck movie series. Uh, and the purpose of that was to uh, just get a sense of all of the sort of additional consequences that could come. These are all science fiction movies like Blade Runner and things like that, that all of the consequences that might come from technology if in fact it was able, as it often does and can and uh, maybe even should in some ways, uh, run amok. Uh, and so that's sort of a deep background for a person that if you were to uh, ask me what I do and, and you had long enough to listen to the answer, I'd probably distill it down to the fact that I'm a knowledge enterprise architect. So. Neil's a, a writer and an entrepreneur, and I'm an architect, but I don't design buildings or things. I design organizations that create knowledge, and they create things like outcomes like synthetic biology or nanotechnology or what have you. And I can say that at least personally as a knowledge enterprise architect, I've been heavily influenced by a wide range of literature, including science fiction, and I'll pick three specific uh, examples. Uh, Asimov in Foundation Trilogy conceptualizes uh, this planet Trantor and this, uh, uh, this highly integrated uh, social, behavioral, and natural science uh, tool called uh, psychohistory or something like that. I don't remember the exact name of it. And uh, Hari Seldon is the master of this, and he becomes capable of predicting the future in a way that it becomes a threat to the government uh, and the empire of this massively complicated uh, millions of worlds, trillions of people, uh, civilization that uh, humans have evolved into. And so the notion of knowledge integration and knowledge pursuit towards an outcome that then has unbelievable consequences through predictive capability uh, had a massive impact on me. Uh, a second uh, writer, Neil himself, had an impact on me with uh, the Diamond Age. And some will laugh because uh, there's people in the room that are a part of the National Center for the Social Implications of Nanotechnology. So in Neil's uh, futuristic view of a, of a nano-infused uh, world with nanotechnology at all levels and other technologies being used, the social implications as portrayed by Neil's fiction had a big impact on me. Uh, Dan Sarowitz is in the room somewhere. I don't know if it had an impact on him, but 10 years ago we were trying to design a way in which the social implications of nanotechnology could be thought about at the same time as it's being developed, as opposed to waiting until after it was developed. Several attempts went along to design that kind of center. Ultimately, at Columbia, when we were on the faculty there, we were defeated. Ultimately, when we got to ASU, uh, we were able to affect more change, different views in Washington. We won one of the two centers that focus on this, and so it had uh, uh, a massive uh, impact uh, on me. The third, uh, uh, not science fiction writer, uh, a science journalist, uh, Janine Benyus. I don't know how many of you know her and her whole biomimicry foundation and her book on biomimicry had a massive influence on me from an architectural design perspective in conceptualizing uh, what we built at Arizona State University called the Biodesign Institute, which was an effort on our part to take all the disciplines that we could bring together and find a way where we could take all of the platforms that nature provides to us that could be bio platforms or photonic platforms or, or, or whatever, all of the systems that we are a part of and how might we use those systems and draw insight and perspective and begin developing our technolo technological pathways from those platforms rather than the more simplistic, crude and often destructive ways that we've uh, engaged in things in the past. And so those are three 
three examples. They're not the only examples, but those are uh, three examples where knowledge architect, me, influenced by literature, uh, both science journalism and science fiction. Uh, some science journalism is actually fiction because you know that what they write isn't actually true. But, uh, and so there's sort of a line there, but uh, nonetheless, uh, a lot of influence on me. Great. Neil, do you want to add anything to the reading list? Well, the, the, the thing that, uh, that jumped into my head, um, I guess it's not an addition uh, to, to the list, but um, the, uh, uh, in this morning's session, there was a you know, discussion of the possible malign uh, results of uh, widely distributed <clears throat> uh, synthetic uh, biology tech. And um, the, uh, the uh, um, in, uh, in, in the world of the, the, the diamond age, there's um, uh, part of what I was trying to do there was to create a coherent fictional world in which that kind of technology was widely distributed, in which everyone wasn't dead. <laughs> and and the, the mechanism that's posited in the, in the book by which that comes about is a sort of artificial immune system whereby um, it's, it's a technological uh, sort of defense in depth that the society erects for itself uh, in order to, um, to defend against unknown uh, kind of nanotechnological and synthetic biological in invaders. Um, before we get in, into anything sort of too nitty gritty <laughs> about government's role in this, I want to ask you both a, a broader sort of philosophical question, which is whether democracy is well suited to supporting the kind of cutting edge synthetic biology research we've been talking about here. You know, I mean, democracy is a great system for many things, but I think we all recognize that it has, that popular, too much popular sovereignty has limitations in certain areas, the Federal Reserve, and decisions about scientific research might well be one of those areas where it's necessary to provide a degree of insulation from public opinion or from, from reactions to public opinion to make the right kinds of decisions. Michael, what, what do you think about that? I mean, is this an area that is, is you know, cutting edge technology research highly compatible with democracy or is it problematic? Well, it must be highly compatible with democracy because the last 65 years of this democracy have seen unprecedented technological advances derivative of decisions made by democratic bodies. And so, therefore, using this sort of old college you know, sort of philosophy, therefore it must be the case. Now that doesn't need, mean that it necessarily will continue to be the case uh, going forward because there are certainly stresses and strains, which maybe we'll talk some about, but there's certainly stresses and strains that are out there about uh, speed of change and our particular first generation American democratic model. I mean, we're still living within the first model of American, the first draft, if you will, of American democracy. It's, it's, it, it has its stresses and its strains. We're at a particularly stressful moment right now as other competing models are putting real-time stresses on our decision-making capabilities. And I think that, that uh, you know, we're, we're going to see uh, changes. Many of the changes may be hard, but if, if the question is, can uh, uh, democratic societies uh, like the United States uh, be compatible with uh, uh, fantastic scientific and technological progress, the answer is obviously. Yeah, and what if the question is slightly different, which is how much do you need to insulate the policy making from, say, you know, direct public pressures? I mean, Congress is not, you know, a great example of understanding of these issues or, you know, wise, calm decision making. Nor have they ever been. And so, <laughs> and so the, the history of the Congress of the United States is anything but gentle or calm or uh, pleasant. Uh, it is a, a, an arena for uh, argumentation and uh, uh, basically debate uh, with winners. Uh, and so because it operates on that basis, it is a winner-take-all system. Uh, and uh, in the way that we've structured our democracy, those that win, they control the appointments to the Supreme Court. They control the leadership of the key committee chairs in the uh, Congress. They determine the tax structure. They determine whether or not the National Science Foundation will have funding or not. Uh, they uh, control through their uh, review and approval process the members of the National Science Board. They control all aspects of the, of the 
organizational infrastructure under which scientific decisions are made, and most of those individuals are not uh, scientifically trained. Uh, many are scientifically literate, many are not scientifically literate, yet nonetheless they're able through advisors and counsel and a, a broad uh, pluralistic system of engagement in representative democracy, they're able to derive decisions that are quite sophisticated and quite complicated, look at the things that they have structured. Uh, massive uh, intellectual enterprises like the NIH or the NSF, uh, an evolving, cumbersome at the moment, uh, patent uh, law that's derivative of actual verbiage in the Constitution. Those are all things derivative of this, at least this democracy as it's presently working. So it is, uh, it is uh, under stress, and we can talk about how it might change, but it is, it is working and it has been effective to this, to this point. Well, Neil, I wonder if you might challenge that at, at all. I mean, you, you wrote this piece, which we, which we have up on Slate uh, today, I think, um, about the development of rocket technology as an example of how government uh, policy works in practice. And it's, uh, it's a fascinating story, and it's essentially satellites look and work the way they do because of decisions government made, you know, often in result to, well, l l to simplify, they were, not all, they were not all purely rational or wise decisions. Yeah, well, what I'd say is that, is that uh, <clears throat> democracies, at least this democracy, can be incredibly productive uh, supporter of research, provided it's just existentially terrified of, um, of some external non democratic uh, country that, that wants to destroy it or, or that is believed to want to, to destroy it. Because as long as that's true, I think it sort of focuses everybody's attention. And so all of the kind of chaotic influences that we get in, in the House of Representatives kind of get tamped down a little bit. And people say, well, you know, listen, it's time to, to, to shut up and get this hydrogen bomb built because we have to build it first. Uh, so as long as there's that kind of fear driving the, the process, um, then I think we do end up building amazing things like you know the interstate highway system or uh, or the, or space launch technology. Uh, and when it goes away, I think we we lose momentum uh, pretty fast. And um, so so right now I don't. Uh, I, don't, I don't see a lot happening in those kind of big tech uh, projects uh, like we used to have back in the, in the Cold War. And, and I'm not arguing in favor of, you know, having big existential, you know, threats. Uh, um, we don't, in a lot of ways, we don't want to go back to those days. Um, but it, it does focus the mind. And I, I assume you, th you think the threat of uh, terrorism post-September 11th is not a great example of that, looking at the development of uh, security technology. Well, I think it's too diffuse. And, and it's not, um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't drive, uh, somehow it doesn't get people's competitive juices going in the way that the Russians did. I mean, you know, the, the Russians, you know, there was an enemy, right? I mean, you know, th those guys... You know, the, the, the stuff that they built, <clears throat> the alternate culture that they created, a whole kind of alternate civilization, was a truly awe-inspiring threat and a challenge and something that we could uh, compete with. And um, the, 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 the fact that there are so, um, diffusely organized terrorists out there who want to blow up planes uh, doesn't seem to have quite the same galvanizing effect on our culture. Um, Michael, when you, you know, the, the ra look at the range of, of cutting edge research that's going on at ASU, do you think the, the principle is the more people know about it, the better? Or are there areas where you think, you know, people, this is so prone to misunderstanding that we're better off doing certain things relatively quietly without a lot of public scrutiny? No, I, I support uh, as being as transparent as is possible and assign the responsibility for transparency to the scientific community itself. So one of the things that we are experiencing right now, I think, is um, uh, a too wide of a gap between the, uh, the general understanding by uh, uh, a broad cross-section of our citizenry 
about where we're going technologically and where we're going scientifically and why we're going in those directions. And so what we have is a population that is, uh, at least at the moment, uh, very trusting. So for instance, in areas related to health outcomes, here we are uh, falling uh, continuously in terms of relative performance. So of the OECD nations, we're 24th in health outcomes and longevity right now with the highest cost, most rapidly increasing cost, highest rate of investment in terms of science and technology uh, uh, from the public sector and very large investment from the private sector. So we've got, we have uh, very uh, uh, unevenly distributed healthcare outcomes across our population, something that we state publicly that our democracy intends to uh, make more, more uh, even, yet we're failing at that. And I think that uh, it is a, a general lack of sophisticated or sophisticated enough discussion and dialogue, dialogue about what we're doing and where we're going and why we're going there that uh, limits us. And so I'm, I'm supportive of, both at the university and elsewhere, of as much transparency as is uh, feasible. Neil, how about at, a, at your, uh, your invention lab, which is a private sector uh, institution, but I mean, do you, do, you, uh, do you think everything people are working on there can be understood and, and should be widely known by the public? Well, uh, a, a fair amount of what's going on there is um, uh, at least the stuff that, that I can, uh, that's, that's been, been uh, made public uh, is, relates to things like disease control. And so there's uh, a, a number of, uh, as an example, a number of uh, inventions being worked on there that relate to uh, the control of malaria, um, distribution of, of vaccines to uh, third world uh, locations uh, where it can be difficult to, uh, to transport uh, medicines before they spoil, um, and, um, and other kinds of um, I would say humanitarian inventions that uh, whose uh, whose purpose I think is immediately obvious, uh, and um, uh, and then and then beyond that, you, you can you can in the the level of, of sophistication in in modern uh, technology is such that you can very rapidly uh, get into realms that um, are are difficult for even even specialized, uh, kind of scientifically uh, sophisticated persons to really follow. So uh, it's, it's my kind of cynical take on it that the sort of public democratic consensus about science has always been largely manufactured. Uh, and that uh, back in the 60s, back in the 70s, um, the, uh, the, the kind of centralized uh, television networks that we had and and kind of relatively limited bandwidth of information um, created a sort of cultural milieu in which um, people tended to trust science uh, and, and viewed it as a benevolent thing that was going to lead us onwards to uh, improve standards of living. Um, and uh, in the last, uh, you know, 10, say 10, 15 years, uh, it's become way more complicated. Uh, because of the internet and the availability of, or, of many differing uh, points of view uh, on the internet. And on top of that, uh, I would say a kind of cynical exploitation of that by some people who want to spread um, uh, misinformation as a way of getting people, uh, getting a certain political base uh, whipped up into a froth. So. Um, so I think in, in terms of, uh, of the public relationship to technology now, um, it's not so much about the, the scientific facts of what technologies really can and will do as it is about uh, how they're being portrayed uh, by people who are kind of good at manipulating the opinion channels uh, available on the, the internet. Michael, that's a rather cynical view, isn't it? <laughs> well, I don't know if it's cynical. It's, it's, uh, let me, let me just add a component to that. I mean, so, so uh, in 1939, the American government spent uh, less than $100 million on research, and most of that was focused on uh, a few things related to aviation development, a lot of things related to agriculture, and things that were at, the point, at that time basically considered almost nationalized industries. And then World War II changed everything, and uh, we had a manifesto come out at the end of World War II, uh, written by uh, Vannevar Bush and a few other people that sort of laid a 
first generation, highly simplistic, incomplete view of a contract between the scientific and technological community and the citizens of this democracy. And in that conceptualization, it was very simple. It says, please give us money to do science. Uh, let us decide what science we want to do, and we'll give you national defense and economic security and health security. They didn't use those words then, but that's what they meant. And then, and then all will be good. Well, as we've become more sophisticated in the, in the last 65 years, now people say, well, yeah, let's look at that health security thing. What we'd like, like is life extension, and what we'd like is uh, fairness and equity, and what we'd like is greatly diminished cost for that life extension, and what we'd like is uh, to be able to, uh, you know, understand the basics of it, and please carry that out. What we've, what we've, what we've failed to do now, and I might be uh, uh, cynical with Neil here a little bit, is uh, we have not realized that our democracy sets our objective functions, and the scientists and the technologists need to meet those objective functions. And where they're not meeting those objective functions, as they aren't now in a number of areas like environmental sustainability, uh, renewable energy systems, healthcare outcomes, and so forth, they need to go back and rethink what it is that they're doing or how they're doing it because the democracy is saying and has said for decades, this is what we want you to do. This is what we want you to achieve. We're trusting you to figure out how to do this. We may constrain you here or there in terms of things we want you to do or not do, uh, but uh, that part of our democratic decision-making equation, in my view, has broken down within the uh, actual conduct of the scientists and the technologists themselves. They're no longer, or not to the extent that they should be, focused on the social outcomes that the democracy is willing to make the $200 billion investment that they're making this year uh, in science and technology, or about that, uh, versus what they were making before we had this contract, which was almost nothing. Uh, that's where the, the democratic system is in need of updating and repair with, within this uh, particular context. Yeah. Well, let's uh, talk about this question of government support. I mean, what, my, what's the ideal uh, scenario for you? How, how big should government be in supporting this kind of research that we're talking about here? And how do you draw this line? I mean, the, you know, the familiar concept is government should support the basic research but not the applied research. But here we're looking at uh, in synthetic biology areas where, first of all, the applied research may not be very commercial and may have tremendous benefits, and second of all, where the line between what's, what's basic and what's applied may be very porous. That, that basic and applied thing are basically convenient tools used to advantage who's ever using them. And so uh, be, beyond that, uh, it doesn't really mean that much. I mean, it, it's a useful construct for some things to classify some things. One person's basic research is another person's applied research. One person's applied research is the tool for the basic researcher to advance their fundamental quest for knowledge. Uh, having said that, I think where things are breaking down in terms of the amount of funding uh, is that we've, we've now decided that we have this highly simplistic, grossly oversimplified model. Please give us money to do science, do research, and we'll tell you how many publications we've had, and we'll see how we're doing against China and Germany and Japan and so forth and so on. And so long as we're like out producing them, and as long as we have more math majors, and so long as we have this and that, and those are indicators, but those are second or third level indicators. The real indicator should be, has lifespan in the United States for all socioeconomic groups actually advanced? At what rate is it advancing? Where are we lagging? Why are we lagging? And we should measure our scientific investment and our technological investment, not for everything, but for a lot of the things that we do, based on a set of outcomes. Now, our, our Congress has difficulty doing that. They've tried, and they try many times, but it breaks down. Uh, and so uh, how much, it, you know, the amount of money that we would invest would be determined by how important is the outcome that we seek, how much progress are we making toward that outcome, what primary, secondary, and tertiary benefits are we gaining from those investments as we seek that outcome? Uh, and right now, we don't have a logic that works that way for the most part. Do you see what, what, what Neil was saying before about the kind of, uh, you know, national fear or national competition? Do you see that as a major motivating factor? I mean, certainly people respond to the idea that the United States either has the opportunity or the need to be the dominant player in new technologies. Well, I mean, I cert it certainly is the case that economic development and economic success of, of our country in the 
present structural mechanisms by which the economy advances are highly driven by technological advance. So we know that, that technological advance and economic growth are highly correlated. We know that technological advance is now highly correlated with scientific activity. So the answer is yes, but toward what end? Toward what purpose? So what is it that we actually want as the outcome? Because it turns out that these scientific and technological advances that we're investing in will produce certain outcomes. The outcomes that they have produced up to this point are a list of very good ones, a list of not so good ones, and a list of horrid ones, all from the same investments that have been, that have been going on. And so we ought to sort of move forward where we have a longer list of really good ones, a longer list of some pretty good ones, and as few of these horrid ones as we can possibly uh, lay our hands on. I mean, we're still dealing with nuclear proliferation from a decision that we made to develop a certain kind of weapon that we thought that we could contain. We haven't been able to contain it. It's not containable. Uh, no technology is containable in that sense. And so that is, is out and about and is moving forward in differentiated ways and, and so forth. And so are there better ways for us to think through what we want to do, how we want to do it, and where we want to go? Yes. Can that be done in the democratic structures that we have? Yes, with some modernization. Uh, uh, is it easy? No. But you have to actually want to think about it. And when you're trapped in uh, simpleton land, like we are right now, right now the, 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 the basic debate, uh, this is true for university presidents, for others, it's like more money, more money, more money, more money, and everything will be good. Well, not hardly. More money for what? More science. What science? Well, the science that we think up. To do what? It'll be good. <laughs> well, maybe yes, except maybe no. Except for the stuff we ban. Yeah, except for the stuff we ban or the, oh, you know, I, I'm really so sorry about that, like that, that, that thing, that, that device that is detonated in the city and then the city doesn't exist anymore, except for stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Neil, I mean, you're, you're an, an investor, I gather, in these, you know, in these private sector no. ventures, both around space. No. No, I don't. No. no. Oh. Well, you certainly follow them very closely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I guess my question for you is sort of in, envisioning these futures, how much of the innovation is driven by government decision making, government support, and how much of this is just, just happening in the private sector, whether the government gets on board or not? Well, I, I think that the, uh, the, the what sort of so the, the, the kind of implicit question that, that's, that's being raised is um, at, at what point do you just say, you know what, I don't need to deal with this democratic process anymore. I'm just going to go out and raise funds in the private capital market. And then I only have to talk to one smart investor you know, or, or a few smart investors uh, to get the support that I need. Um, and uh, there has been a wave of, of people from the technology world um, who have, you know, once their company has gone public or whatever, they're able to, um, uh, to just personally uh, invest in, in new technology projects at a scale that actually is, is worth doing. So um, I think that is kind of the new wrinkle uh, that has emerged. Like Craig Venter, would that be an example? Yeah. Yep. He puts down his own money, he raises other capital, he's advancing towards a certain objective. And yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, or, or, or people who've maybe made, uh, made money in one sector and, but have an interest in a, in, in a different one. Um, like these guys. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to think of, um, like Tesla, is there a, do, do some of the Google guys in, invest in? Yeah, Elon Musk is, is yeah. Yeah, right, right. right. So, he's, so he started out with, with one thing, which is PayPal, and, but he's, he's supporting R&D in, um, in a completely unrelated you know, uh, sector or multiple unrelated sectors of technology. So that's kind of the new wrinkle. Um, and you know, depending on how democratic you like your technology policy to be, you can see that as either uh, a scary, threatening development, since it takes it out of the public sphere and makes it all kind of behind an intellectual property wall, uh, or you can see it as a great way to circumvent the uh, limitations of squabbling congresspeople. Yeah. 
But there's still the issue, and we'll open this up for questions in just a second, but there's still the question about what to restrict, and those restrictions are, you know, uh, Congress can restrict what, yeah. what, what kind of research the private sector can pursue. What sort of role do you each see for government there? I mean, is there, you know, partly from the, from the perspective of reassuring the public about where this is not going to go, um, but also simply from, from the point of view of, you know, responsible supervision and the kind of scenario you're, you're talking about with the creation of, uh, you know, potentially super destructive organisms. You know, how does, how does government go about the restrictive side of this as opposed to the support side of it? That's where I actually get a little bit worried about it because um, in the older model, um, kind of the more Cold War model that I'm talking about, government's doing both. It's supporting, mm -hmm. it's fostering, it's partnering, and it's also exercising a restrictive kind of regulatory function. Um, but at least it's involved on all sides of the game. And if we get into a situation where the government's only involvement is restrictive, is to veto things, then um, I think uh, there's, you know, my concern is that uh, any, anything that uh, the government's capable of regulating becomes kind of a political football and whoever is best at manipulating um, public opinion uh, gets to veto, uh, you know, whatever uh, project they personally stand to, uh, uh, to lose from. I mean, when it comes to nuclear policy, which is the example you're using, you, you know, it's easier in a way because only government, still really, only government can do it. There's the proliferation issue, but in terms of, of the basic research and the creation, it sort of couldn't happen without government support. With the kind of synthetic biology uh, research we're talking about, uh, as Andrew Hessel was talking about, you know, this may be a kind of garage movement where, where people are pursuing a lot of this in a very, very lo-fi way you know, outside the, the purview of, of big, big public projects. Well, you know, for those of us that live in America, I mean, you're going to have to face up to the fact you live in a democracy. And uh, in that democracy, there's going to be decisions made by the people that we elect. And they're going to make decisions that are more or less informed. Uh, my own uh, fear right now is that as the scientific and technological elite continue to move at light speed to synthetic biology and to this and to this and to this, the folks that we've elected collectively sitting back in Congress are like, what is that? What are you talking about? What is, oh, is that related to this thing that we're hoping that, oh, okay, well, that's fine. Why don't you go ahead and keep doing that? But this other thing over here, I don't know, that's, somebody tells me that that's like a living human or this isn't a living human or this or this or this. And so as, as, this, as this debate progresses, I think the main thing that we have to do is we have to remember that we're focused on a set of outcomes. We have these democratic decision-making bodies. Uh, I, I deal both with the Congress and the Arizona legislature, and I was there yesterday. Uh, came in on the red eye uh, last night from, the, from meeting with those folks. Uh, they wouldn't track uh, tremendously well with the complicated nature of, the, of, uh, of synthetic biology evolution and the investment in fundamental discovery that would lead to these new life forms that we could construct so that from these life forms we could achieve these objectives. So what we're, what's happening right now is that we're in a moment in time where the scientific and technological elite are out way ahead of these democratic processes that we have. And so you say, who do you blame for that? Or who do you go to? To me, I go back to the scientific and technological elite and say, well, you've got two choices. You can either slow down, which is not in your nature to do, because you're driven by what you're discovering and as you're learning moving forward, or you can step back and take the time to do a better job of educating what outcomes we're working toward or coming into alignment with those outcomes or doing a better job of educating those that are electing the people to the offices that are going to be making these restrictive decisions. Because at the end of the day, those individuals in those elected positions can restrict anything they want, any time they want, like that. But you really think they're, they're educable, Michael. I mean, you're talking about, you know, you're talking about, I mean, it's interesting that you put so much of, of the burden on the people who have to do the better job explaining. I, but, I, yeah. I, ab I absolutely unequivocally think that they are educable. Uh, and I believe that because I've seen it happen. I've been involved in those processes. I've seen it actually occur. We are continuing to make great progress. We're continuing to make all kinds of, of, of good decisions as we go forward. But the more 
elitist and separatist and only driven by scientific outcomes that the scientific and technological elite becomes, and the less focused they become on a set of collective outcomes that we're working toward, using healthcare as, to me, the most obvious example that everyone can understand. You did all this science, and what did you do for me? You raised my costs, and now I have the lifespan equivalency of, I don't know, like Cuba, uh, you know, a less wealthy, less R&D intensive uh, uh, country and so forth. And so unless we can figure out how to do a better job at that, then this gap will grow and there'll be, in my view, more and more restrictions, more and more restrictive opportunities, less and less well-informed decisions that are made. It'll be an anchor or a drag until such time as there's a correction that comes back and says, oh, we're ever so sorry. We really would like these resources. And so we're going to have to actually spend some time uh, uh, learning together about what we're doing, outcomes, how we're doing it, process of science and so forth and so on. And so as opposed to the argument that you hear every once in a while, I remember this famous phrase that somebody said with the defeat of the superconducting super collider for Texas. Uh, one uh, senior physicist came in and was testifying before Congress and he was irritated at what he called the defeat of this project by the C students. <laughs> the C students. That's it. I mean, that's sort of the gap at its widest form right there. Well, clearly, uh, what I'm hearing is that our future as a technological society depends upon science fiction writers. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, that's the, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm half joking and half serious because that, that's kind of what science fiction writers do is explain some of these things in a way that is hopefully entertaining and accessible. Um, I just <clears throat> think that we need to find a way to make more money out of it because I didn't realize until now just how important we were. So, <laughs> I mean, have, have you heard of any cases of science fiction writers being commissioned to uh, produce a, a piece of science fiction for effect? No. Really? Does that happen? No. Okay. But, but, but I think you're, you're exactly right, Neil, because if, you know, if Michael is saying that, that we, the filter of what Congress can understand is unavoidable, let alone the filter of what the Arizona legislature can understand, it is the, the creative ability to, to help them understand it, which does, as we're coming back to the point at the beginning about literature, is absolutely central. You need a Jack Ryan who, you know, is a synthetic biologist, and then... Uh, all your problems are, are solved. <laughs> yeah, well, well Crichton, Crichton tried to develop some of those, but they sort of went in multiple directions down usually the path of uh, near mortal destruction of everything. So. <laughs> but Crichton's a kind of bad example here, isn't he? Because, I mean, there's a, you know, uh, there was probably a lot of bad understanding about climate change and some other issues absorbed by people through reading uh, Michael Crichton. Fiction is fiction. <laughs> right. Um, all right, well, let's open it up for questions here, and, and why don't we... Um, Start in the back here, and we'll just—I'll just work our way around. Yes, you, sir. Uh, my name is Ar Arnold Kling. Um, I guess here in Washington, we just automatically equate governance with Congress, the president, and so on. Here in the United States, but it seems, it seems like a—we've heard a lot of things today that suggest that, well, we could have kids doing things in garages. There was a map of a uh, one of these. Uh, consortium that had pins all over the world. They weren't just located in the United States, much less in Washington, D.C. Uh, and of course, I've, I have read Snow Crash, and I, I have used it to try to explain things. And uh, in that, that book, the uh, U.S. government is introduced as kind of a comic character. Um, so should we be broadening our thoughts? And uh, so this is one more example. The internet is not governed by the US government. It's got a very different governance structure. So should we be thinking about alternative governance structures than what we're used to? Alternative governance structures doesn't sound like um, something I would know about. But <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, what? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, the general answer I would give you, you know, is, yeah, all the time. It's, uh, you know, evolve or die. Uh, and, and that's true for everything. That's true for institutions. That's true for universities. That's true for government structures. It's true for American democracy. Yeah, you have to evolve. I don't know about governance being the, the right word. I mean, uh, 
you know, I focus most of my comments obviously on the United States because we're actually talking about a democracy. Uh, there are some of our competitors who aren't that, and so there, that's a different uh, classification, a different analysis, a different model. Uh, but in the, in the system that we're a part of, uh, do we need modernization of our decision-making mechanisms? Absolutely. Do we need uh, all kinds of reform and advancement? Yes, that's why I stress this notion that, uh, that we have, and I've written a little bit about this. You know, we have an overly simplistic model running at uh, uh, light speed right now, producing scientific and technological alternatives that the rest of the, of the decision-making apparatus that exists around it, not related to the actual scientific and technological decisions, isn't capable of fully grasping. There should be some cause for concern for that, not knee-jerk negative concern, but positive concern. How do we get engaged in the right kind of ways to get the kinds of outcomes that we think we're getting by making these investments, or if not making these investments, creating the um, environment or the climate where investments are made by someone other than the government that produce uh, positive outcomes for the society. I just want to inject one question before the next one. Michael, is there any other country that you think does it better? Better? Was a better, better approach to these, this, that is driving more positive outcomes? Or, yeah. No, not, not better in the sense, I mean, I think that one thing that's happening is that too many countries are trying to mimic what we've done because their first generation is behind our first generation. And so you see that even in the design of universities and how they're evolving and where they're going. And so I think this is an area for uh, uh, a lot of attention. I do know that uh, uh, Europeans tend to be asking more of the uh, sophisticated questions about outcomes, positive and negative. So if there's a place where uh, questions are being asked that, uh, that are really shaping this overall conceptualization of the outcome model, I think that's probably in Europe. Yeah. Um, the lady in the background. And there's a microphone coming around. Hi, so. my name is uh, Rebecca McKinnon. I'm a Schwartz uh, Fellow here at New America Foundation. I just wanted to follow up on, on the gentleman's question and, and maybe if there are other people in the room who have experience with multi-stakeholder governance models, it might be really interesting to hear from some of them because, you know, as, as, as I'm hearing this discussion and I, I think Mr. Crow raises an incredibly important point that our political structures are not capable of dealing dealing with our technical innovation and ensuring that our techni technical innovation takes place in a way that is in the public interest. But at the same time, is the nation state the correct level at which to be addressing these problems when you have so many other nations that are working on technologies and you know, so it's all globally interconnected? And similarly, do we really need to be looking very seriously at multi-stakeholder models like the Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, you know, the way ICANN uh, coordinates, uh, you know, names and numbers for the, for, for the domain name state space, the way IP addresses are coordinated, you, you know, the, the way the, the World Wide Web Consortium, or, you know, there's, there's some very interesting emerging you know, efforts at multi-stakeholder global governance. There are a lot of problems with them, but I, I wonder if some, if 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 a really serious uh, and detailed look or exploration needs to be made in that area. And I'd I'd really love to hear from anybody else in the room who has further insight. Yeah, great, great question. You want to go ahead, Michael? Yeah, I would just say yes. Yeah, I was on the Internet Two board for a number of years, which is. Uh, uh, a, a governance uh, attempt of certain aspects of the internet competitive with other, other aspects of the internet largely uh, controlled by universities uh, uh, sort of emanating out of the University of Michigan and um, uh, at the end of the day uh, uh, very complicated uh, but effective <coughs> as a uh, boundary spanning kind of organization between users and suppliers and standard setters and competitors and so forth. And so one can count uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of creatures uh, that are out there performing all of these functions within the general environment that we've constructed. And so this multi-stakeholder environment in this highly pluralistic democracy that we live in here in the United States does produce these organizational transformations to, to try to do some of these things. Some of them work more effectively than others. The internet, I'll just go back, is infinitely simpler in terms of its uh, long-term implications, in my view, than synthetic biology by comparison. 
uh, and uh, the earlier uh, speaker, maybe he's still here, yes, you know, this notion of sort of using verbiage and uh, terminology to sort of link them as if they are of the same impact and complexity, not that you were trying to do that. Uh, we have to be cautious about that, just in the sense that they are similar and related, similar and relatable, connectable and advanceable, but very different uh, in terms of, of uh, outcomes, because the internet can't affect uh, ecosystems, it can't affect uh, human biology directly by itself, which is latent in that sense where synthetic biology is not latent to a very complex process of biological evolution. Unless you want to add nothing. something. No, I got nothing. Oh, oh sorry. Sorry. Um, we've all not knocked our microphones off at this stage. Um, there's a question uh, worked up. all the way over here. Sorry. We're not getting you on the microphone, but just speak up. Yep. Hi, that's much better. Right, My name is Maria Farrell, and until recently, I worked for ICANN, the multi-stakeholder global governance body, uh, working in a, you know, trying to get it, get on top of some somehow this uh, uh, technology that was just changing the world. And I can tell you. Um, as Rebecca says, there are interesting multi-stakeholder models. My, my answer to this question, can technology policy be democratic, would be, well, maybe it can, but I'll tell you right now, it's like 1930s corporatism. Um, it's basically controlled by uh, governments and large corporations, and I hate to sound like a raving lefty because I'm not, but you, when you look at the, the um, I'll give you an example. In two weeks' time, the, there's going to be a meeting where the US government has decided to stop uh, a five-year multi-stakeholder process that says, hey, let's open up the domain space to everybody in the world, have lots of new top-level top domains. They want to stop it because intellectual property lawyers and um, s some very particular um, uh, religious fundamentalist interests are opposed to it. And it's just so easy to get in the way of these multi-stakeholder processes. So I would say um, technology policy can be democratic, but these, are, even when you look at where we've tried to, to deal with those issues in a multi-stakeholder way, it is so open to capture. Um, so it's a lot harder than it looks. Right, so they have, they have power to the extent that the United States government is not actually giving up ultimate power. Do you, Neil, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Well, that's that's the, the first sort of cynical thing that pops into my head when I hear the word stakeholder being used is exactly that kind of situation where if, if stakeholder is just a code word for giving somebody veto power, then sooner or later they're going to probably use it. Um, uh, ideally, there are stakeholders in the more literal sense that uh, they've got a, a stake in the positive uh, success of the venture, whatever it is, and so they've got some incentive to see it actually uh, move forward and succeed. Um, let's see, in the front row here. And just the microphone coming your way. And please, uh, just to remind everyone, um, keep the questions brief. And yeah, thanks. My question is very simple. The Supreme Court has ruled that life can be patented. Patent. And I wonder how this will impact. You make it sound like anyone can invent anything in his or her garage. However, if life can be patented, how will this affect this, the synthetic biology industry? And as she had mentioned, what role will corporate America have in this, and what outcomes can you predict or perceive from that ruling from the Supreme Court saying life can be patent? Someone can own it. Right. Would that limit use of it? And also access to everyone. If someone has a monopoly on it, who sets the prices? How is it distributed to the common people and the public? Yeah, I guess, Michael, is, is, you know, was that, is that a good decision? I mean, should you be able to patent an organism. You know, what's interesting is that we're going we're gonna to spend a, a fair amount of, of time, maybe a few decades. Uh, uh, Paul Berman, a dean of the uh, Sandra Day O'Connor School of Law is here. Our, our law dean is here. And, and Gary Marchant, one of our law faculty members, who's the head of our science and technology law and society uh, center, looking at exactly these kinds of very complex issues. Uh, we're uh, basically. Uh, uh, they haven't even come up with a diaper for us. We're so young in this particular <laughs> arena. Uh, and so we're like a newborn in this arena 
still laying in the warming table. Uh, and so the Supreme Court is going to make a series of decisions driven by what? Driven by legal contests between organizations that bring their contests to the Supreme Court for resolution. When a contest comes to the Supreme Court for resolution, the only thing at stake are the parameters within <coughs> the defined contest. That is the way the court works. And so uh, uh, on that particular contest, that was that particular ruling, that particular time, given those particular dynamics. And so given that we're so new into this and we're dealing with so many different things, we've got a lot of thinking to do about uh, courts and rulings and judgments and speed of change and all kinds of things. And so science, technology, and the law is a vastly underdeveloped area of the law which is in need of serious attention. Um, yes, sir, right here. The microphone's coming your way. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my, <clears throat> my name is Richard Benedict, uh, former career foreign service <clears throat> in the State Department and ambassador responsible for international environmental negotiations. And I do have a question. Um, I think that we are underestimating the um, current social and political context in the United States, which is largely based on short-term considerations, uh, profits, uh, consumption, and not enough of a consideration of science. Uh, we see this in the climate issue. We did see it under the for a while in the ozone. I was responsible for the ozone negotiations, as I mentioned. And it was only when it went up to President Reagan, oddly enough, as some people might, might not have guessed, that he overruled some of his principal advisors and came out for our decision, for our position for a strong Montreal Protocol on ozone. But we're now in a situation where the country is actually um, in a anti-science populism and dominated by um, a philosophy. Or I'd just like to have your reaction because otherwise it seems to me that we're living in kind of an art, or that we're debating in an artificial atmosphere where we think we can solve things easily if only everybody would be reasonable. But the current atmosphere, both polit political and social, I, I would cite the Creationism Museum, for example, is very much anti-science, and how can we overcome that? Yeah. Do you feel, Neil, that we're, you're, living, you're working in an anti-science context that's too, uh, too driven by uh, greed and short-term profit and interest? Well, it's just, uh, uh, I mean, you're here, I'm, I'm with you. You're, you're preaching to the choir here, man. The um, I was just I was just thinking about it uh, in the you know in the context of the of the Chinese high speed trains. So um, the, they've got this amazing high speed train that runs between um, the Shanghai Airport and Pudong, and it's uh, it's awesome. You know, it's something that we really ought to be worried about in a competitive sense, that they're building stuff like that and we've still got the passenger trains that we've got. Um, but we're not. Sputnik, we were terrified of, you know, because it went over United States territory and it beeped. <laughs> you know, and so, and so we put a huge amount of effort into addressing that. It was a long-term program that, that worked. But the, for some reason, we're not scared of the high-speed train in, in China, and, and we don't uh, respond to that competitively in the way that it would be in our interest, our long-term interest, to do. Um, and uh, I don't know, uh, so I, I share your assessment of the problem, but I don't know what to, to do about it particularly. I don't know if there is a way for a, a, a genuinely democratic, uh, kind of decentralized uh, nation um, to deal with those kinds of things unless it's scared to death. But why do we look at that, Michael, and not draw the conclusion that, hey, perhaps the Chinese model is better at planning investment, scientific research, and that not having to go through this democratic decision making could be an advantage? Well, it's not an advantage. It may look like it's an advantage, but it's not an advantage because there's a lot more. I don't want to get into Chinese versus American politics and outcomes and social well-being and uh, uh, rights and so forth. I want to address the ambassador's uh, earlier comment. So I generally agree with your concern about the nature of discourse and rhetoric and the angle of attack that various sides look at. But I'm also an individual that tries to look at the net-net uh, outcome. 
So for all of its tumult and for all of its uh, uh, violent, uh, uh, verbally violent interactions and the arguments and so forth, our democracy has still decided to do certain things. We do have a $30 billion plus investment in the National Institutes of Health that's derivative of those processes. It may not be targeted on exactly the right things. It may not be having the right effectiveness that it needs to have. Uh, we are able to actually even conceive of the nature of uh, solution routines to the, to the ozone problem and the Montreal Protocol and global climate change and global climate warming and so forth because we have hundreds of millions to billions of dollars of expenditures going into climate modeling and climate assessment and so forth. So we are at the highest level of scientific energy and creativity and know-how that we've ever been where we're having difficulty, what we're having difficulty doing right now is focusing it to produce certain kinds of outcomes. And so, so yes, there's anti-science. Uh, yes, there's anti-this and anti-that. And I have been involved in the front line, on the front line of some of those uh, debates and struggles. And it is always the case that if the scientific and technological elite approach the democratic decision-making mechanisms that we have in the country, from a position of haughtiness or elitism or separatism or give us the money and leave us alone and go away and so forth, then you will get these negative reactions always back and forth. Now back to this notion of, of, uh, of uh, evolution and so forth that you worry about. I hear this all the time. The number of people that don't believe in evolution as a percentage of the population is probably smaller than it's ever been. There's just more of them by number. By number. You can shake your head however you want to shake it. In Arizona, which is not exactly known as a, a hotbed for new thinking, uh, we were able to launch a school of human evolution and social change without a single political response. What about the Texas? The Texas? Well, Texas is another place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, we have, we have a lot of questions here. Uh, Ma'am, uh, right, right here, you've had, you've had your hand up. Uh, um, good afternoon. I'm Patricia Wrightson. I'm from the National Academies, but please don't blame them for what I'm about to say. I, I guess I'm really concerned about how we're using the term democratic and democracy, and I'll admit I'm a political scientist, even though I'm at the National Academies. And, I, I, you know, we talk about, you know, let, let's not compare ourselves to China because Lord knows there autocratic and we're democratic, well, I'm, I'm afraid that those may be the completely wrong categories because I think the main difference now is we used to have money and now we don't. They, they didn't used to have money and now they do. And to really put this in terms of freedom, democracy, I, I, I find almost embarrassing. And, you know, what, what we've got in this social sphere of ours right now is the seam splitting because there's no money. When there was plenty of money around, everybody was kind of happy. Well, there isn't anymore, and the people who have more power and money are doing a better job of claiming this, the common space. But I think that has a lot more to do with the fact that we don't have money than that we are a democratic country. <laughs> um, anybody want to respond to that comment? We have lots of money. We just spend it on things that are maybe different than what other people spend their money on. We spend more on defense per year than all of the other nations on the planet combined. I see. Okay. okay. Um, sir, in the front row here. The microphone's coming to you. Right. Um, Mark Nadal, I wanted to follow up with Michael, um, sort of parallel to an earlier question, but this time on people who were elected on the platform of small government, they make the, they get the science. You explain it to them. They say, you're right, Michael. This is a good investment. It'll pay off 12, 15 years down the road. But I made a commitment to the people who elected me that I would balance the budget. And I can't afford to support that $30 billion. I need $200 billion. I'm going to start to take that money. I'm concerned. Are you concerned about that? And I'm concerned in other democracies in Europe where budget pressures are tremendous. That's going to be a major concern, whereas in the non-democracies, China, they can say, we can invest for 15 years because we don't have to run for re-election in two years. Well, I mean, the last two comments are connectable if you, if you believe this uh, fundamental premise about the money is, is at the heart of the issue. Uh, that isn't exactly what you were saying, but using that as, as an example. So, so uh, why is it that the, that the democracies right now have the lowest rate or the slowest rates of economic growth? 
And so there's a series of fundamental questions that we have to ask ourselves related to that because the politicians are faced with the fact that deciding that there's certain levels of taxes that they don't want to go beyond, which is their prerogative since they are the taxing determination uh, group, they determine what the taxes will be, given where we are in terms of our rate of economic growth, certain things that we're attempting to do we can no longer afford. And so as you're looking at all of that, one has to look at why, are, why is it that, that the democracies are the slow growers right now? What is it about what we're doing and how we're doing it that have turned out to make that the case? And per perhaps that's something that we ought to take a look at. Yeah, do you want to add anything to that? I mean, go, going to your Sputnik example, you know, it's not just that we had a common enemy and, and so on. The context was people trusted government and government was more solvent. I think uh, the, um, there is something about, uh, uh, and this is just kind of an intuition that I've got, so it might not stand up to hard analysis, but I think that there's something about the way that we improve uh, existing technologies over time that leads to a, a state of lock-in where it, it becomes very difficult to introduce radically new technologies. So I've been you know, since I was a college student, I've been interested in sort of alternative fuels and different uh, ways of getting energy, and it seems as though those are always just around the corner. Uh, but what I've been hearing since, you know, the mid-1970s is that, you know, wind power or solar power is still just a little more expensive than uh, oil, than burning oil. Uh, and, and so pretty soon, real soon now, it'll get cheap enough, it'll be com uh, competitive with oil, and then we'll see a change in how we get our energy. Um, but uh, it never seems to happen. Uh, and I think it's because the markets kind of adapt. Uh, the, the, um, the entrenched technologies are kind of one step ahead of the new technologies that are trying to replace them and always have a way that they can cut their prices or whatever and respond to any new competitive pressures that come along. So the, the, this phenomenon of lock-in uh, technological lock-in is something that's of great interest to me right now and, and I think that democracies and particularly financially strapped democracies may be more vulnerable to it than other kinds of governments um, because if, if, if you don't have a kind of dictatorial regime telling you to make a major change and if you're trying to be frugal with the resources you've got then your best option is always to take the system that exists now and make tiny little incremental improvements to it over time uh, instead of swapping it out for something kind of new. And that's how we end up with Amtrak and the Chinese end up with their, you know, their, their super trains. Great. I think we have time for two more questions uh, if they're quick. Sir. Sorry, just one second. We can't quite hear you without the microphone. Nigel Cameron, Center for Policy on Emerging Technologies. Very brief question. Question of context. In 10 years' time, are we going to be having the same conversations? We were having the same conversations 10 years ago. I'd love our two um, rather extraordinarily insightful panelists to, to give us some sort of sense of, you know, what are the odds we're going to be in a fundamentally different situation? What are the odds we're going to be talking the same way? Thank you. Great, great question. Go ahead, Neil. I'd say 90% will be in the same situation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it'd be 90%. I, I actually think that um, uh, your life isn't the same as it was 10 years ago, individually or personally. Your family circumstances are not the, ch the same. There's too many variables, so therefore, how can it be the same? What happens when we're, when we're working at this particular level is that we're at the aggregate level. We're at the systems level, and we're talking at the systems level. Aggregate level and system level things don't observably change dramatically in time frames related to that except on very rare occasions uh, like in certain parts of the world going on as we speak but even then even then there were events that led to those things and so I would say yes it will be fundamentally different although the system will not be fundamentally different by that time the nature of the discussion will have to be different because these simplistic views that we have of synthetic biology right now they're not simplistic in the sense of technologically simplistic, but it's not deployed in the field with a thousand examples that are having impacts across a number of places, and it might be within 10 years. When you're talking about the factories that we heard about this morning and uh, other things that uh, Drew Indy, I don't know if Drew is here, where is Drew here? He's here speaking tomorrow, I think, but Stanford professor Drew Indy 
uh, is talking about the kinds of the biofabrication plants he's putting together and so forth, those will be in place, those will be operating, those will be advancing, and so therefore, below the aggregate, the discussion will be very different. At the aggregate, it will be similar, but I think afflictedly different. Uh, the gentleman in the front row is going to ask the last quick question. Microphone coming up. Thanks. I'm Stefan Richter with The Globalist. Michael, um, it's not the money, you say, and you started out by saying... Well, she and I would have to have a longer conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Good. But you started out by saying we're only in democracy 1.0 in the United States. Yeah. Western democracies as a whole have similar problems with not having too much money. Right now we're all in tight circumstances. But what strikes me as somebody who was born in Europe and now has spent 30 years in this country is that the real difference in the end is that we're lacking an amazing amount of social cohesion, of will for cohesion between elites and everybody. That's the one thing where the Europeans, at least with a similarly little money, have the ability to then engage in longer planning horizons to do environmental transformations, energy transformations, and major, uh, major challenges that we face right now will only work, such as changing an energy system, if somebody is willing to plan ahead for three decades. And do you think we'll ever get that fixed? Because that seems to be the first thing, because otherwise we're not just stuck here for a decade with the same topics, but longer. And you can both either answer that or have a last word about anything you want. Well, there, there probably is more cohesion in Europe, you know, following a war that killed 30 million people on the continent 65 years ago. I mean, unbelievable stresses that were culminating in that conflict that led to completely differentiated outcomes. Uh, in, the, in the case of social cohesiveness in the United States, it waxes and wanes and comes up and goes down. We happen to be at a moment where it, we are seemingly uh, not as cohesive as we might be. It's because we're focused on our differences more than we're focused on our commonalities. We're focused on what separates us more than we're focused on what has connected us. Uh, I believe that we will return to that again because there's no fruit that can be born from this focus on separateness. There's no fruit there. There's only fruit from a focus on commonality. Europeans learned that the hard way. Uh, Americans have learned it in the past in the hard way. We have an opportunity to advance maybe not in the hard way. So I'm optimistic about us returning to, in fact, the. New America Foundation and ASU have another project, a joint center in social cohesion that we're launching on uh, February 22nd. So that's another area that we're focusing on. What brings us together? What are the common points that bring us together? And how might we take advantage of that? Neil, yeah, do you have a concluding thought for us? Yeah, I, um, you know, the bulletin of the atomic scientists has this clock where they set the hands closer to midnight, uh, depending on how great they see the peril of atomic destruction. and. I've been thinking for a while that we should have a, a sort of calendar that basically tells us how many years it's going to be before we be, become Afghanistan. And, um, you know, because there's a, a country with of people who are fiercely proud and independent and like to do things their own way um, and, and heavily armed and, um, <laughs> and, and quite religious. Uh, and, um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm being somewhat facetious. Uh, I don't think that we will end up as, as Afghanistan, but you can kind of see that calendar moving up and down. From, you know, like after the Tucson shootings, there was a, suddenly a wave of, uh, of national goodwill for about 24 hours uh, around the time of, of Obama's speech, where it, it felt like we could add a few decades back onto the Afghanistan calendar. Uh, and then it, you know, it, it comes back at other times. So I, you know, I think that something will eventually come along that'll uh, create more of a sense of national cohesiveness and, and maybe get us behind um, effecting some of the changes that we need to, to, to make. But it's hard for me to see right now what that might be. And we're going to follow that with a lighter note. Thank you both very much. Thank you.